Welcome to Vegan Food and Living Simply Vegan podcast with me, Holly Johnson, and my co host, Molly Pickering. Yep, it's the Holly and Molly show. Each week, we'll be ranting about vegan news, raving about new food launches, and responding to your questions on all things plant based. I also chat to vegan chefs, experts, and influencers about everything from fermented food and nutrition to weight loss, herbalism, and seaweed. Today's podcast is sponsored by Sweet Freedom, the better for you 100% vegan brand who now have 14 sweet syrups with 13 great taste awards and counting, plus a chocolate spread to rival Nutella that's diet friendly. Every single one of their 14 products are vegan, plant-based, cruelty-free, naturally sweetened with fruit, palm oil-free, GMO-free, high or a source of fiber, and all packaging is recyclable. They are also a business friend of Peter and donate part profits to them. Choose from six different chocolate syrups, supremely multi-purpose from making milkshakes to drizzling over ice creams, pancakes, chopped fruit, yogurt, the list is endless. Seven sweet syrups, including caramel, vanilla, and gingerbread for sweetening and flavoring coffee, shakes, and drizzling over everything. Plus, their game-changing Choc Pot chocolate spread, 74% less fat and half the calories of Nutella. Sweet Freedom products are available now in Tesco's, Sainsbury's, Asda, Waitrose, Morrison's, Ocado, and Holland and & Barrett. We use and are in love with Sweet Freedom products. Everyday indulgence with zero guilt. Vegan treats don't get any better than this. Hop over to sweetfreedom.co.uk for stockists, plus oodles of sweet treat recipes, or join in the fun over on Instagram or Facebook, Sweet Freedom UK, and TikTok, Sweet Freedom Official. Well, I hope everyone's been enjoying watching the Olympics. Um, And if you're going to miss the coverage and uh, being inspired to live a a healthier life, then you can have a listen to Holly and Molly on the Simply Vegan (laughs) podcast, who can uh, fill that void in your life. How are you this week, Molly? I'm good, thank you. I don't know if I'll be able to fill the Olympic void in people's lives, but I'll give it a good go. (laughs) We we can do it. We can do it. We can do it. We can do it. (laughs) How are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm in a bit of a food coma from um, all the food I've been eating. <laughs> oh my <laughs> I God. I feel the same. Oh, um, I went to a vegan fair, local vegan fair. Um, I live in a small town called Dorchester in Dorset. And um, I went to that on Saturday and got way over mm. overexcited. Like <laughs> I was literally just, I, I was almost panicking. You know, when you go to these events and you, don't want to choice. there's too much choice which us vegans are not used to we can't <laughs> cope with um I shouldn't complain but yeah too much choice and I didn't want to make a mistake you know when you like yeah I know what you something mean. and then as you're just starting to eat it you look around and someone else has got something that looks even better <laughs> so I had that pressure of like oh what do I go for so I ended up, um, I bought a pizza that I shared with my daughter, which was from a company called Fire in the Shire. Nice. And that was like vegan feta, walnuts and um, balsamic vinegar. Oh, Bal- like a balsamic well, glaze. You out. Yeah, that sounds packed. That was very nice. I had, um, there was like a little Greek stall, which was cooking up some amazing food mm. like it was like a sweet potato falafel type thing and I, I know you say falafel you think oh boring dry but it wasn't it was yeah. just incredible with all these different dips like beetroot dip and a mint what like all these colorful oh. hummuses um in like a flatbread with loads of other bits and bobs in there um I had what else I have I honestly went crazy um oh and I had a really good salad from um guys actually from Bristol uh soy ahoy you heard of them um I think I might have you know I don't think I've ever eaten from there but I think I know the brand yeah I think they make all their own like seitan mock meat yeah. and stuff mm. so yeah I had a little salad box from them and my mum my mum embarrassingly went up to the <laughs> the vegan coffee uh, van and asked if they had any normal milk oh no <laughs> so I was very cross with her I was like mum you're at a vegan fair and there's nothing normal about dairy 
<laughs> now, this is literally what we were talking about the other day. It was, <laughs> it was so yeah. funny. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think it was last week's episode, wasn't it? Or no, was it the end of last series? I think. Talking yeah, about I think so. Changing our language because we all we all sort of say, "Oh, yeah, we're well, compared to the normal," and it's like dairy is not normal. Killing animals is not normal. <laughs> So, yeah, and then of, um, later on, I'll be reviewing the Lidl's range, which I've been eating today. <laughs> so all just in all, so I'm just, food. I know, yeah, I need to do like a week, sort of week long fast, I think, or juice yeah. cleanse or something. Um, but let's let's talk about the news, first of all, climate change mm. <laughs> or the climate crisis, should we say. Um, we've kind of got a code red this week from the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They've published a new report, um, which has been eight years in the making. And basically it's saying that we've got, we've got no time left. I mean, it's just, this is so urgent. Why is no one doing anything? <laughs> oh my God. It's so hor- it's It's horrible, isn't it? Because you just feel stuck and it's just like, right okay so actually what can I do and then you kind of like see all these reports and stuff and it's so easy to just switch your phone off and be like actually no I don't want to know like too much anxiety for me today um you know turn on the news how many wildfires are there Greece is in a crisis Turkey's in a crisis you know Germany obviously with their floods last month it's just bonkers and everyone's just there like carrying on it's scary and obviously we don't want listeners feeling depressed and anxious by us talking about this but we we have to talk about it don't we we need to start you know sharing this information and and talking about it on social media you know I go on Facebook and no one's talking about it why not it it needs to be at the forefront of our minds and you know going vegan is one of the biggest thing well actually I think the UN report said it's the biggest thing isn't it that you that you can do to um you know reduce your impact on the climate crisis the COP26 that's coming up, all the nations are being urged to come up with new plans to reduce greenhouse gas, gas emissions um, to stop us going over the 1.5 degree rise. So let's just, you know, let's just hope that these leaders are going to sort of step up and actually, you know, make these make these promises and actually put some change in progress I hope so because wasn't it last time they had a bloody steak and lobster dinner followed with like an air show was that in Cornwall that was one in Cornwall wasn't it oh god I I, I'm literally it's embarrassing it's so embarrassing if I was an emoji right now it would be the monkey (laughs) with the the hands like oh just face plant what what's you know what what are our leaders doing I mean stop stop messing around um yeah I mean the Met Gala has been in the news if you head over to the vegan food and living website you can read more about this but they are going to be running an all vegan menu which is obviously what they should have done in Cornwall at the um GA summit but didn't so yeah good news about the Met Gala obviously that's sort of a big star-studded event isn't it Definitely. And I think, you know, when you have platforms like this, you know, the Met Gala is renowned and it's been going for so long and it has so much influence, um, not just sort of fashion wise, but I think like so many celebrities and stuff go there, like you, you even influence in them who can then further the influence down the line. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I think what they're doing is really cool. So they leading up to the gala, um, they're doing on the Vogue Instagram account, like uh, vegan recipes like that they are going to be serving there so that you can try out at home, um, which I think is so good. That's really good. Yeah. I mean, Vogue <laughs> must have a, an absolutely huge following. Exactly. I, I don't actually follow them myself because I'm just <laughs> not fashionable enough for <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be relevant to me at all. I'm sitting here in my uh, MS sweatshirt, organic cotton, but you know, it's not exactly it's high organic. fashion. <laughs> <laughs> I think you look lovely. You'd oh. be on the cover of Vogue. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. I'd need a lot of uh, I'd need a lot of help and photoshopping, I think. But... <laughs> Um, well, let's go from the Met Gala right down to earth with a review of the new Lidl range. Oh. <laughs> Maybe slightly more relevant to uh, to some of us. Um, yeah, so they've got they've got veggie 
veggie vegan week this week so you need to yeah. get down there ASAP however I have asked them before and when items are really popular then they get considered for sort of um being part of the main range on yeah. a permanent basis so okay all the vegans need to go down there buy everything <laughs> and then they'll carry on stocking it it's uh, it's called Vermondo, which is quite cool. And they've got 17 new products, including vegan fish fingers, burgers, dairy-free ice creams. Um, yeah, as I said, I'm in a food coma because I went down there <laughs> this morning and purchased a big kind of haul and um, then had to eat a load of it for... <laughs> I had to eat it I just had to <laughs> before recording well my son my son is the only one at home with me today and he's he's nine he's not vegan yet I hope and pray one day he will be yeah. he you know he's a lot of plant-based stuff at home but yeah um he's not you know if my daughter was around she'd be excited and she would have eaten some of it with me but I, I just had to take one for the team so um yeah so I tried the fish nuggets which are 199 and they're kind of like little um little sort of cubes of Ooh. breaded fish obviously not nice. fish I think it's cauliflower um and rice that it's based on then oh. they've got dill in them as well Really, really nice, actually. And they also, the box comes with two um, little vegan tartar sauce sachets. Stop. That's yeah. so cute. I, I love know. that. I know. That's so, so handy. Yes. I mean, they are frozen. So I cooked the fish bites, the fish nuggets, um, and the tartar sauce sachets were still frozen. So I had to sort of like mush them up a bit. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was so good. They, they're quite oily. I sort of... When I took them out of the oven, I put them on some um, kitchen roll and, and sort of you could almost wring them out. They were that oily. Oh, man. OK. But once you've taken some of the oil out, they're lovely. So, Ooh. yeah, definitely give those a go. They also had these like savoury spreads, which are £1.29. And they had some of these sound a bit odd. Um, <laughs> tomato and basil. That's, you know, quite normal. Courgette and curry. I wasn't sure about I didn't like, they didn't have that one in in my littles pineapple and curry again quite unusual aubergine beetroot and horseradish and wild garlic um I tried the tomato and basil and the aubergine they're really really nice when you say spreads what do you mean like I suppose like a a pate but they're not okay thick. that's what I was thinking yeah okay. it's, it's more like a dip in a jar mm. basically so you could dip crudités and things and breadsticks in okay I, I had them on like sourdough toast with a bit of salad mm, lovely yeah that sounds lovely yes. really good um so I'm definitely going to go back and get some more of those uh, I also got the almondy vegan chocolate cake which is 2 99 and that's frozen so I'll be defrosting that and trying that later eating it <laughs> oh god maybe not maybe I'll yeah <laughs> do, do some food sampling outside the house or something <laughs> Um, but yeah, really exciting. And, and hopefully they'll keep some of them on, you know, full time. Yeah, I think it's such a good thing. And it starts at like 99p, the range does, doesn't it? I think their tofu is 99p, which is just, it's yeah. so amazing. And it just opens so many doors. It just makes it so much more accessible. Obviously, you know, it is processed, but then you've just got a kind of like pros and cons really, isn't it? Yeah, I think anything that kind of makes it more accessible is a good thing in my eyes. Yeah, Obviously, definitely. Yeah, as, as we always say on this show, you know, everything should be in moderation and in balance. And you don't want to be living on. I mean, no one would want to live on vegan fish nuggets every night anyway, would they? But <laughs> no, <laughs> no. And again, they're really good. How about you? What have you been trying this week? Oh, so I have tried the talk of the nation I feel like the... we need a drum roll for this <laughs> <laughs> um I tried the sausage bean cheese melt from Greg's very exciting there's been a lot of build-up about this hasn't there I used to love Greg's when I was younger like that was back in my little town the Greg's bakery was like the star in the shopping center <laughs> it's so funny and I always remember having corned beef pasties so <laughs> Thinking back now, it's just not very nice. No. But it, like, the pastry was exactly the same as that. So, like, you know, quite buttery, flaky. I had it and it was molten hot. It was so warm. 
which I think would be the only time that I'd really eat a hot pasty if it was this one because I don't want to eat cold beans no yeah when I when I saw this being launched I did think ow that's gonna burn your mouth if you bite yeah. into like hot beans it was so hot I've burnt my tongue <laughs> oh no okay so listeners beware bring it home don't eat At it caution. yet yeah <laughs> Eat Give it caution. 10 minutes. My boyfriend told me, he was like, don't eat that just yet. And I just bit into it. Oh, no. Okay. And cut, cut I regret it. Open. it. <laughs> leave it. For, yeah, if you cut it, leave it for a bit. But it was nice. The sausages inside, I think, again, in my head, I was thinking, you know, when you have like sausage and beans and you were younger and it was just that horrible process, to whatever yeah. it was. Um, it wasn't. It was kind of like a bit like a Lincoln Lincolnshire sausage. Okay. So it was like quite herby. It was nice. It wasn't like there's was quite nice chunks in there. So it wasn't just like a bean pasty. Yeah. Um, and the cheese was nice. I I tried to find what cheese it was, but I wasn't too sure. I feel like it might have been. It reminded me of Vi- it's a fire life. Yeah. I yeah. just said I don't really like I don't really like the vegan cheeses, so can't no. remember which one it was. Um, but it was really nice. It was it was good. Would I have it again? Maybe not. But it, it feels like the sort of thing you might have if you had a bad hangover on a Sunday it is, morning it or Saturday is. morning. <laughs> like going out shopping maybe early and you grab one of those I feel like it'll it'll do you it's like a breakfast in a pasty isn't it yeah yeah it's such a British thing just chuck whatever you can in the pasty and then <laughs> you'll be done <laughs> I when I went camping a few weeks ago to Devon um we were we stopped off on the way back and we were like you know we were with another family there were kids so it's kind of like quick you know everybody out it was kind of blowing a gale and raining so we just <laughs> Um, we kind of ran into the nearest places. So um, the girls ran into a cafe, which happened to be just randomly a vegan and veggie cafe. Oh, wow. Um, and all the, we were like, which which of the cakes are, are vegan? And they were like, all of them. And we just stood there like in shock. What, what, Crying. What, what? <laughs> yeah, not knowing which ones to choose. So I think we spent about 30 quid on cakes thinking, oh, well, ev- everyone will love these. The boys, however, headed for, I think it was, well, no, they went to Greg's. Um, my <laughs> husband came back with like six Greg's vegan sausage rolls. And I was just like, oh, no. So I had the... Um, I had this lovely sort of artisan vegan cake and a, and a, <laughs> co- a coffee. And then the, ve- the vegan sausage rolls was just sort of sitting in my bag. And I just kept like for the journey home, I just kept <laughs> thinking about them sort of, mm, maybe I should try them for the podcast. So I sort of had one bite and then I was like, mm, actually, that's quite nice. And then I had another bite. Yeah. And then by the time I got home, I'd eaten like the whole sausage roll. <laughs> I think that's absolutely fine. Don't. I feel My ashamed. Eats... <laughs> Sherry eats two in a row. It's crazy. <gasps> Does he? It's mad. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's. Yeah. But I think it's the salt that makes them so nice. Do you know what I mean? It's it's moreish. Yeah. What I did really like from Greg's, but I don't think they do them anymore, is the vegan steak bake. That was oh. one that I really liked. Yeah, they, that sounds good. I don't think I've tried that one. But I think they've gotten rid of them for the oh. cheese melt. Oh, that's a shame. Well, maybe they'll switch mm. it back. So yeah, there you have it from Liddles and Greg's. So let's move on to a reader question this week. Um, you can email simplyvegan at anthem.co.uk if you'd like to send us your questions. Literally ask us anything. Um, we might not know the answer, but we um, we can obviously- We'll give it a go. <laughs> we'll give it a go or we will speak to our um amazing experts that we work with who can answer whatever it is you want to know um it could be to do with nutrition it could be recipes it could be lifestyle stuff so drop us an email you can also follow us on instagram at simply vegan podcast and at vegan food and living um and don't forget to leave us a review on your platform of choice so the question is about seafood obviously we just spoke about um little's vegan fish nuggets but um this is a question from Anya who says, I miss seafood. Are there any good alternatives? So I thought we'd just kind of chat about what we make at home. That's yeah. um, obviously a bit healthier than, you know, a processed supermarket option. Do you want to go first, Molly? What kind of fish alternatives do you cook? So I think um, for me, I mainly do like jackfruit. So jackfruit or chickpeas are perfect for this kind of thing. We've always spoke about um, you know, chickpea tuna and stuff. Um, I think 
jackfruit is a really good one it's really great for replicating tuna so um a couple of weeks ago i made um it's like an italian tuna tomato pasta sauce thing uh which was so delicious and um yeah just add some like nori flakes in there a bit of seaweed um always add like capers and dill just sort of give it that like fishy Mm. taste so lovely it just adds so much to the meal um I've got a can of banana blossom in my cupboard and I have been waiting to use it. But I, the only thing that I can think of doing is like fish and chips, like vegan fish and chips with it, like frying it. But I don't know. I, I, I'm I kind of on a bit of a health kick at the moment. So I say eating a Greg's pasty, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry you've had to do that. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's all for the job. It's fine. <laughs> um. So, yeah, I don't know what to do with that yet. I'm sort of like looking around. Maybe I might, I don't know, maybe do some like fish tacos with it. That would be quite nice. Oh, yeah, that'd be lovely. Maybe some grilled fish, like do grilled banana blossom. Yeah, wrapped in nori or something. Or maybe, yeah. Lovely. Well, I actually made for the first time yesterday vegan crab cakes, which Mm. I was way too excited about. Honestly, I'm (laughs) just becoming obsessed with food, which I suppose is good seeing as I host a a food podcast. (laughs) I hope so. But uh, yeah, I'm just, you know, I never used to be like this. I was never a foodie at all. Never that bothered. You know, I just have a few nibbles and a glass of wine. You know, I wouldn't be like excited about going to a yeah. restaurant and now I'm like just dreaming about food all the time <laughs> so I made these crab cakes with hearts of palm and in case you think what on earth is that you can get it tinned so you know like you get uh jackfruit and things like that yeah. It, it yeah it comes in tins are two pounds something for the tin which I thought was quite a lot but you can probably get it cheaper elsewhere where did you get it from I think I think it was Tesco's okay um so or maybe it was Sainsbury's I need to check that but yeah so I grabbed a tin of that and then you blend that up with chickpeas Mm. um you then save the chickpea water which is aquafaba so it has like the protein in it and then you whisk that up until it sort of gets a bit of a foam on it oh my gosh add in lemon juice Dijon mustard uh kelp flakes or seaweed flakes or like a whizzed up nori sheet which again you can get in all the supermarkets yeah um and trying to think what else went in there now um Worcestershire Worcestershire sauce (laughs) my favorite which isn't actually vegan is it you have no it's got anchovies in it yeah so I just put soy sauce in Mm -hmm. um and then and vegan mayo Mm. and then you add the chickpea the sort of mashed up chickpeas and hearts of palm in with it then stick it in the freezer to kind of firm it up then oh breadcrumbs sorry that was it panko breadcrumbs you put in the mix and then save some so when you bring it out the freezer you kind of take out a little you know a little bit mash it into a ball roll it in the panko breadcrumbs lightly fry it and then I stuck it in the oven um, and I served it with when I was camping we had a restaurant we had um, sweet corn ribs oh which I found really funny because they were like about eight quid for these sweet corn ribs it's basically just sweet corn but it was r- really cool so I did it with sweet corn ribs marinated in chili and lime and you basically amazing just, you just cut the sweet corn a different way so it's quite hard you sort of cut it down the middle and then cut it into like strips oh okay I know what you mean sort of like on the actual cob sort of thing yeah. and cut it down more like on the rind is it like the center bit yeah yeah bit. nice okay yeah and then um bake them in the oven yeah with the chili and lime so they were lovely Ooh. And yeah, a few other bits and pieces, some slaw and potatoes and stuff, and uh, sugar snap peas. So yeah, sorry, I'm totally going on a, off on a tangent about my <laughs> vegan crab cakes. I just I want to know. I want to know more, please. <laughs> um, so yeah, definitely try that one. Um, another thing I've made, uh, especially at Christmas, is smoked carrot which you know is a replacement for smoked yeah. salmon so you just get one of those I think is it a julienne you kind of really yeah. finely slice the carrot like a mandolin kind of thing yeah maybe it's that yeah I'm really not um too technical in the kitchen <laughs> <laughs> just uh grab the nearest implement and, um, and go yeah so yeah you, you really thinly slice the carrot then you boil it 
um so it's just softens mm. and then marinate it in like um liquid smoke or smoked paprika wow. and mm. some some seaweed it's if you go to so vegan they've got a brilliant recipe for it along with a like a cashew cheese cream cheese so you put that on a bagel with the smoked carrot and it is absolutely delicious yeah they are my two top recipes for fish replacements so I hope that helps you out Anya (laughs) okay well I'll be speaking to Dr Alice Bruff who is an ex-pig vet she was so kind of traumatized by what she was seeing in within the industry that she became an animal rights activist so oh my god that's amazing yeah so I'm really excited to speak to her she's involved with the scrap factory farming campaign and also animal rebellion so um yeah we're gonna get some insights on what actually goes on behind closed doors um without too much detail because I think yeah I'll just cry and have nightmares yeah um, sometimes it's just best you know you know what happens yeah yeah so um yeah it's, it's gonna be uh a, a, maybe a slightly emotional chat yeah. but um yeah stick around and have a listen Hi, Alice. We met recently, didn't we, on at an online event for Scrap Factory Farming. Um, it was quite moving, wasn't it? Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming along to that. It was a really great turnout, actually. Yeah, there were people in tears, including myself. So, um, yeah, it was, it was quite emotional. Um, but we'll come back to that later. Let's, let's start by discussing what led you into um, veterinary care in the first place and how you came to work with livestock. Yeah, so... Um, I basically wanted to be a vet since I was like this big um, and there was no other kind of career that I ever wanted to do. Um, I'm from like a farming background. So my grandfather was a livestock and arable farmer and um, very kind of rural upbringing. So I kind of started working on farms like every holiday in my teens and um, between school um, school terms. Yeah. And I worked on a pig farm um, when I was 18 for about six months in my gap year. And that um, was quite an intensive pig farm. And at the time I was sort of like, this surely can't be, (laughs) surely can't be the normal standard. Um, uh, So I, I kind of drove my career into that with the kind of overarching aim of looking at the welfare standards in pig farming. Right. Um, And I I then started in pig farming when I graduated and quickly realised that that farm was actually very good compared to lots of others. Um, So, yeah, I did four years. I started off in mixed practice, so seeing all the different species and and kind of trained up on the pig side and ended up doing like four years in the pig industry, Um, which I obviously went into kind of not a vegan very much like pro farming pro british farming yeah. um in every meal type jobby uh and quite quickly stopped eating pork and then quite quickly after that went vegan myself so i did another kind of two or three years as a vegan in the pig industry and it sort of just got to a point where i was like i'm not i'm not making a difference here like i really tried yeah Um, and yeah that was kind of I feel like I can do more from outside the industry now that I've got all the knowledge and experience wow I mean you you sort of grow up don't you as an animal lover thinking oh yeah I'd love to be a vet and look after the animals but do you feel like you were complicit in in you know the industry yeah definitely I mean yeah as you said you go to be a vet to like help animals because you love them um and it was kind of you know most days I was having to shoot animals for welfare issues um and that became like a huge part of my job job was euthanizing animals and doing post-mortem inspections um just on farm uh with a blade <laughs> and gloves um and I was just doing the same stuff like across the board all the disease like disease is so common oh, right God horrendous because of the conditions that they're kept in disease just kind of whips through the population really quickly um 
same sort of welfare issues so again because of the way that they're kept they're very prone to like tail biting so like cannibalism right. chewing each other's tails ears vulvas etc um and kind of it's like stress beating yeah. each other up and I was just going on farm after farm and seeing all this like horrendous stuff and having to euthanize pigs all the time um so it was like I, I started off kind of oh I'll just maybe buy like organic pork or free range but then I was like visiting these farms as well and seeing the same not obviously entirely the same but still the same issues and I was yeah. also like visiting slaughterhouses um which is not funny at all and there's you know there's no kind of good way to kill an animal so even if you're buying like organic or whatever you think is good it's still ending absolutely horrifically um so yeah I quickly moved on from that like thinking I was doing the right thing by buying higher welfare and inverted yeah so it's not all factory farms it is the all the organic ones as well and and any farm basically yeah, pretty much any farm. They're not devoid of the, the same sort of disease issues and problems. I mean, genetically, what we've done to animals as well, because we've we've pushed animals now, like livestock animals, to the point where they are growing so quickly, like they're producing so much like, you know, eggs, dairy, whatever, lean muscle. Um, they're all a bit knackered and it's really horrible to watch. So even the even on like your little family farm slow growing they're not slow growing because the genetics are so far gone right um oh it's just it's just yeah I find it I find it hard to stomach um and I know a lot of listeners will um because you know anyone vegan for the animals I think just it's just heartbreaking isn't it so at what point then did you say right I can't do this anymore I'm vegan I I'm i I can't help from within the industry um what did you do did you quit your job as a vet yes <laughs> um yeah I left I toyed with the idea of maybe going into like whether I could do like welfare inspections for the APHA so like government welfare staff um or anything along those lines but I just wasn't making any headway where I was and I you know I tried really hard like I was really principled with my welfare stuff and I was really like um kind of on it and it yeah. was almost yeah I can't um go like too far into it because obviously um as a vet you have like client confidentiality clauses that you can't be disparaging about yeah and <laughs> um but it yeah I just wasn't achieving anything like I wasn't getting onto any like welfare boards um yeah, before I left, I was a finalist for Young Pig Vet of the Year. So, I, you know, I was doing well, but yeah. I wasn't like, uh, you just can't. It's such a big, big industry and the system is so, like, hardwired in. Um, yeah, I just felt, I toyed with various options, whether to, like, move into, like, I don't know, HDB pork or some sort of industry or pharmaceutical stuff. Um, but I was like, actually, I've got four years of, like, sickening stories you know memories experiences all the knowledge of everything that goes on on these farms it would probably be better for me to just stop people from eating pork because there's nothing that they can do drastically enough to improve the lives of pigs like nothing has changed in the so it's 15 years since I first worked on that first farm and absolutely nothing has tangibly changed yeah um improve their lives if anything it's got worse right so I mean presumably you needed an income so what did you do um uh, so I went to work uh at Viva right for about months as a veterinary consultant and campaigner so it was great amazing um and then I just thought it would be great to be able to input to like all the organizations and like any project that comes up that requires like veterinary input um because obviously loads of loads of organizations do like investigations there's all sorts of different projects going on so I just thought I'll try try it alone see how it goes so since then I've just been doing um all sorts of different things like getting involved with loads of different groups and um yeah obviously the legal challenge and everything is going on now yeah various like documentaries 
radio, that sort of thing. So um, that's what I've been doing. But income wise, uh, not going to lie, it's a struggle. Um, yeah. Like I'm not on Patreon or anything, which I definitely should be because I've just been working, like, it's basically like I've been doing full time work for the last year and a half with no um, pay. So. <laughs> Uh, I need to sort that out. <laughs> I mean, you are just such a champion for the animals. You really are. It's just, it's such an amazing story. But you've been involved with Animal Rebellion, haven't you? How did that come about? And what's it been like working with them? Oh, so that, I was just trying to remember how, how I got involved with them, actually. It, it's all sort of merged into <laughs> like one big thing of activism over the last year. Yeah. So I was doing stuff with Bristol Animal Save, um, the Save Movement, um, sort of from home. Um, and then when things started opening up a bit in lockdown last year, um, we so tragically Regan Russell was killed. Um, it was kind of the middle of last year, wasn't it? Yeah. And um, so we wanted to do a vigil for her um, in memory and like trying to raise awareness um, around the issues in the slaughterhouse stuff as well. So um, we organised a vigil outside Canada House in London and um, Animal Rebellion got involved with that because I was like, obviously, like get loads of people to come to this. Yeah. Um, protest and vigil kind of thing um so I did a speech there and then I think off the back of that I got asked to do a speech for the rebellion um which is the one that's on YouTube which you might have seen yeah um, yeah when you google your name <laughs> you can see the videos <laughs> oh god googling my name is like a bit of a tragedy <laughs> so many farming forums having a good crack but yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're you're not popular with the farmers are you <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> I mean coming from a farming family how do your family feel about your activism um I think they're actually really proud of me so uh in the last few years both my mum and my gran have gone vegan as well wow um and everyone else is kind of becoming more mindful of the issues and less mocking of my stance on things. Yeah. Um, even my grandpa is like actually really proud of me for like standing up for what I believe in. And obviously when he was farming back in the day, it was nowhere near as like intensive. Um, I don't. Yeah. I mean, it probably wasn't still amazing. <laughs> no livestock farming is amazing, but yeah. Um, were wasn't anywhere near the scale of farming so I think he's genuinely like really proud that I'm doing something about how things are going yeah oh bless him um let's talk about the scrap factory farming campaign so what's this all about and how can we get involved with it mm, um yeah thanks for asking about that this is a major thing that's going on at the moment um so if you head to scrapfactoryfarming.org that's the website that will explain everything um it will link you there's a contact form on there for anybody who feels like they want to volunteer or um just get involved in some way or offer like a skill that we might be able to use and um, like we've had um you know videographers helping us make a little film and um people making graphics for us and um, people doing data stuff and social media and everything so like any volunteer that wants to get involved that would be amazing um also on there is the um link to like the crowd justice page which is where you can donate directly to the legal team uh or you can paypal and it's uh that goes direct to humane being which is the the group of volunteers running the show basically um but yeah the the campaign is we are essentially bringing a legal challenge to the uk government to ban factory farming completely by 2025 um, and start immediately like uh, stopping planning applications for new units um, and that for this particular legal case is on the basis of the, uh, the risks to human health so in terms of like pandemics um, antibiotic resistance and then kind of as an aside like all the pollution issues climate change that sort of thing um, obviously for me welfare is like the big thing and I think for a lot of people but um in terms of bringing that challenge to the government we're in the middle of a pandemic it absolutely made sense and there's so many like warning signs going off mm. um 
And for me in practice, there was so much that really concerned me um, in terms of disease, but also like the amount of antibiotics I was using on a daily basis to counteract like what would be termed production diseases. So diseases that only basically come about because of the way that we're like treating these animals. Mm. Um, so yeah, many, many major problems there um, and particularly with factory farming. So it's kind of like, the low hanging fruit that's really so deeply problematic on every level like it makes absolutely no sense for us to still be you know subsidizing this way of farming or actually allowing it to be happening so tell us about the antibiotic usage then because i know when you were on the the sort of webinar um you were saying is it 80 percent of our antibiotics are used in animal farming Um, So that's like a worldwide figure. It's over 70% of antibiotics are used in livestock. Um, The US is is about 80% or more, which is obviously hideous. Um, And other countries are kind of up at that level. Um, Britain, we're actually only around like a third, so around like 30% um, of our antibiotics are used in livestock. But that's still a huge volume of like life-saving medicines. Um, And it's something which we've kind of been focusing on or the industries have kind of been focusing on to monitor and bring down um which they've done but actually it's now plateaued and is going up in certain sectors so that kind of indicates that where we're at now is basically what we need to keep these animals alive in systems which are not fit for purpose um and the worrying thing from an antibiotic perspective is that there's massive overuse so Obviously, with factory farming, you've got lots of animals crammed into one space. It's very, very difficult to treat an animal on an individual level. So you end up doing like blanket treatments um, and then animals which are not sick get antibiotics. Um, They might be receiving the wrong antibiotic for the bacteria, because obviously, if you go in to farm and someone says "Mm, 20 of my pigs have died overnight, you can't faff about and do testing and wait for like bacterial cultures to come back and do antibiotic sensitivities before you start treating so what sometimes happens is that you cycle through two or three different antibiotics before you get something that works so bacteria are exposed to antibiotics which are not appropriate for that pathogen um and then kind of misuse um you're kind of trusting most of the time trusting the farmer to select the antibiotic which they think is appropriate for what they're seeing and administer that at the correct dose for the right amount of time and often that just doesn't happen and I can say it till I'm blue in the face um, on farm and train people how to do it but it just so often I'd go in and look at a meds book and be like why have you not why have you given this at half the rate for like two days instead of seven kind of yeah. thing so it's just massively, uh, I'm massively difficult to ensure it's being used appropriately. What are the dangers of this then? I mean, what what are the consequences going to be if we carry on like this? Yeah, so, I mean, already there's about 700,000 people dying each year from antibiotic-resistant bacterial disease. Um, that is forecast, forecast by the World Health Organization to reach 10 million by 2050, 10 million a year by 2050, which is obviously extremely scary like much scarier than COVID um and the way that we're going we're just it's getting quicker and quicker because of the way that we're using antibiotics and particularly um in livestock where it's very poorly regulated in in many places um yeah worrying very worrying it it really is I mean surely it's you know a no-brainer that, that yeah. factory farming has to end. I mean, is this going to be a difficult case? Is there a chance of winning? Uh, I don't know. It's very difficult. Um, recently, there's been... Um, so the Animal Welfare Bill, the Animal Welfare Act, has, has, is having amendments at the moment. Um, there's a new Animal Welfare, Welfare Act due to come in. Sorry, my words. All right. <laughs> um, but there are big Tory donors really fighting it um, who are involved in the livestock industries and that sort of thing who really, really don't want this to come in because that will obviously restrict 
um, you know, if we say that animals can feel pain and can suffer, that's going to restrict what we can do to them. Mm. Um, a lot of very kind of wealthy, powerful people uh, against banning any form of like factory farming and that sort of thing. So it's a challenge and it very much depends. So we we submit our evidence, we've submitted all our evidence to court and that goes to one judge to decide whether we have a case. So it really, really depends on that one person. Wow. Okay. Um, that's a goer, but um, we'll see. That's in the process at the moment. Yeah, well, I think as much as we can do to publicise this, you know, that's um, that's what we all need to do and get on board with this and hopefully maybe find some rich vegans to uh, fight back <laughs> yeah 100 i mean obviously the legal fees are going to be fairly astronomical if we yes. do end up going to court um and it just as well like even if we don't get it to court or even if we don't win the case still like the amount of awareness that we can raise is really important on this issue and also what we've been doing has um kind of encouraged people in different countries to start similar movements and similar legal challenges to their government so Fantastic. The idea is that, that there will come a time where so many people are, are challenging their own governments to do this one, I want to say fairly simple act, like, you know, we don't need a food system based on a hideously cruel livestock industry, um, we could very easily have a sustainable plant based system. And there are many ways of achieving that they're just not wanting to look for it at the moment. But I think I feel like if enough people are demanding this and and you know seriously like with a legal challenge and not just you know yeah crying about it hey yeah. <laughs> it's uh hopefully somebody will take notice and actually I mean there are countries around the world that are you know already saying we don't want any more factory farming and it's actually some surprising countries I think France has voted to ban cages by 2027 don't quote me on that I feel like uh it's something like that but yeah, it's, I feel like we could do it so easily. Yeah, well, this is it. The French aren't exactly, you know, I'm stereotyping here, but they're not known for their love of vegan food, are they? You know, they... Of course not. And you, you think France, you think foie gras, you think, yeah. um, you know, hideous delicacies that yeah. go on. Um, yeah, there, there's more countries. So, sorry, I don't have those on the top of my head right now. I'm a little bit tired. Uh, no, that's okay. Don't worry. You've been um, you've been dealing with the John, Geronimo the alpaca, haven't you today? Geronimo the alpaca. Yeah, that was an early start this morning to go and protect Geronimo. Yeah, campaigning to because uh, he's um, been ordered to be euthanized because yeah. um, Defra are saying that he has TB. And it could spread to cattle. Um, and there's a there's an, a court action being taken to try and save Geronimo, isn't there? Yeah, uh, yeah. So there's been this has been going on for four years. Uh, it, Helen, the owner, has had a legal battle with Defra as well um, about this um, alpaca that she brought in from New Zealand in 2017, who tested positive for TB on the. Um, and for Plex test, which is um, not validated in Camelas, there's very little data. Um, it's also not validated in the way that they did it, which is priming with tuberculin, which is like the, the antigen, the protein in bovine tuberculosis. So um, effectively what's been happening is he's being primed with this protein and they're testing for an antibody response, which he's obviously going to have because he's being injected with TB yeah. basically the protein from TB so he's obviously going to be producing an immune response to that um so DEFRA are not allowing her to do a blood test which would be a PCR um so that would test for the actual bacteria um they're not allowing that they would allow it if he was dead though so um it's all very ridiculous and it really highlights the major flaws in the UK's bovine TB policy um mm. their badger culling policy it's all based on incredibly flawed science uh, and just isn't working you know tb isn't getting any better and it's costing 150 million pounds of taxpayers money every year Gosh. um on flawed science which for some reason nobody wants to look at presumably because um you know it's like one of those badger badger culling yeah. shooting at 
like we don't want to look at our kind of abusive animals that's something that people probably enjoy doing if I'm honest and yeah. it feels like some action that they can be taking against this disease which could very easily be controlled with vaccinations like every other disease uh, and sort of basic biosecurity measures and cattle measures cattle based measures yeah. sorry I went into loads of detail on that it's okay <laughs> <Can't worry. laughs> um how do you how do you kind of sleep at night knowing you know having seen all these things going on and obviously you know getting involved with these campaigns you've been to slaughterhouses I mean I yeah I think I'd sort of be quite disturbed by it all and I know a lot of people are really they're sort of scared aren't they to know the truth so they don't want to see it they don't want to get involved they want to kind of hide from it which is understandable because you know some of it is just so horrendous how yeah how do you kind of cope with it um so I came out of the industry with PTSD, like actual PTSD, um, you know, the standard like recurring nightmares, like really horrible kind of physiological issues as a result of that mental trauma. Um, and that has taken quite a long time to kind of be at a manageable level. Obviously, I've been involved a lot since leaving the industry and in, like reviewing footage from farms and mm houses and stuff um and it it does still very much affect me uh and also in a way that because I'm not there not in the industry I'm not there to like actually physically help the pigs which you know was limited in that role anyway but at least I was kind of there yeah so now yeah when I'm reviewing footage it really is like a major hike but I feel the only thing really that's not the only thing but like the the thing that's good is when I feel like I'm actually doing something like making a difference using my you know veterinary degree using my knowledge to do something about it so I just kind of have to keep pushing forward on that um yeah that's quite a difficult question I do sleep at night now which yeah is, is good but um it's been a real journey and it still obviously very much affects me I think it makes it difficult when I'm having conversations with people so like street activism or even just like friends and family it's very difficult because it feels quite personal to me because I can explain to people what happens and tell them how horrible it is and people can literally look me dead in the face and say oh that doesn't happen in the UK and I'm like yeah no it does <laughs> I've yeah. done that boys I've done that myself like I've done all these horrible things so sometimes like that's quite a challenge yeah. so I'm not like in, removed enough from it just yet I don't think I'm getting better yeah uh, and I think the more I talk about it the better it gets really yeah I think it's sort of coming to light isn't it the human impact of the you know of animal agriculture and the way we farm animals because it's not just about them although a huge amount of it is but actually it is the slaughterhouse workers you've had PTSD you know it's it's impacting people in so many different ways um do you feel hopeful for the future um (laughs) I go up and down with that question uh I mean this morning turning up at the alpaca place and there being loads of people there who'd camped like got there straight away and camped overnight to protect this animal was really nice like faith in humanity restored yeah um but um, we're in very, very scary times, aren't we? Like the climate stuff, the weather, mad weather stuff, the fires, the floods. Yeah. Um, everything feels very, very uncertain, very rocky, um, yeah. which worries me. Um, God, do I feel hopeful? I really do go up and down with this. I just think... Uh, everyone's got to buckle down and do the best that they can and that's how we're going to get through yeah Uh, I'm hoping at some point people will realize that billionaires should not be going to space and we should not be eating animals yeah and that (laughs) thing and I feel like more and more people are which is great um and more and more people are kind of wanting to get involved like I think there's you know fair few vegans nowadays and fair few people who are exploring that kind of um lifestyle 
but I think more people are now like oh I should probably do something with this like knowledge like they've yeah. obviously got knowledge um that's made them change their own kind of habits and, and choices uh it's now time for people to like take that to the streets like get going on some activism and stuff like that there's obviously the um another rebellion coming up uh, at the end of August in London. That's another Extinction Rebellion. Animal Rebellion will be there as well. Doing another speech uh-huh. <laughs> at the Animal Rights March. So that's brilliant. Um, so would you recommend that we kind of get go along to these things? Because historically, uh, you know, activism, it's been very extreme. A lot of people are very turned off by it. You think, oh, it's those crazy vegans again, kind of, you know, putting up these signs of animals being tortured and and whatnot, but it does feel like we're in a different sort of uh, era now. We're going into, like you say, it's kind of getting urgent, code red, as they've said. It's very much an emergency. I mean, not forgetting the 80 billion land animals that we slaughter every year and what's happening to them. Yeah. The climate and ecological emergency is very much an emergency and animal agriculture is hands down the biggest driver of these issues like deforestation the emissions the pollution like it's so bad on so many levels um so yeah i feel like just go along to something even if it's um i mean there's so many different forms of activism now and so many different groups like just maybe try a few things out and just go to stuff because also what you get from that is that you meet like-minded people and people who aren't going to make you feel uncomfortable with your choices mm. um, and things like vegan camp out which is uh in a couple of weeks i need to write my speech for that as well <laughs> oh you're gonna be there um, fantastic yeah yeah so things like that it's great for meeting people and you know we haven't we know when they're we've nowhere near won this fight like there's still billions of animals dying so anything that people can come up with to try in terms of activism it doesn't need to be like getting on the streets doesn't need to be like locking yourself to labs and stuff like that (laughs) it can be something like really creative it can be musical it can be um you know like online it can be just you know personal outreach that sort of thing and just kind of exploring that side of things looking into like people who already do stuff online like some really inspiring people um and really great information out there just to sort of arm ourselves with even if it's just for like one-on-one conversations it's like yeah, yeah there's, ev- there's something that everybody can do even if it is just these like one-on-one conversations if that's what you feel comfortable with that's brilliant advice and I think food as well you know vegan food plant-based food is amazing and it's delicious and that's it's amazing. healthy so I think, you know, that in itself is activism, isn't it? Get everyone around um, now that we're allowed to get together again and (laughs) cook them some amazing dinners. Yeah, and I feel like, you know, again, there's something for everyone, but I feel like Game Changers was, was, sorry, a Game Changer. (laughs) (laughs) Things like that that appeal to different audiences, like going along that route, like really just excelling as a person and being really fit and like eating this amazing food really can inspire a lot of people as well as the like more horrible stuff that I do, (laughs) bringing the reality to your screens. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Um, You know, I, I get very emotional with these things. Like I said on the call, there were a lot of people on the scrap factory farming um, webinar um, that, we, yeah, were, were really moved by, you know, everyone, the people that were speaking. So, yeah, head over to that website and um, find out more of that, about that and see how you can get involved. Yeah, let's keep in touch. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff coming up for me. Um, the End of Medicine documentary will be out quite soon. I think it's going to streaming services to be pitched on Thursday which I think will be quite a big do you know about it if I sent you anything I've heard of it yeah so that's um it's uh Joaquin Phoenix and Rooney Mara's latest like executively produced um it's Alex Lockwood directed it who did 73 cows which right. is yeah um and Keegan Coon who did Cowspiracy and What Health and all the and, right. and everything um uh directed and produced and it's all about the like pandemic antibiotic resistance stuff um and it's great and i'm in that and like there's a load of really amazing people in it um so that would be i think that'd be quite a big thing because i am much i'm like it's sort of centered around me sort of i'm like we've 
um, the story kind of pieces the whole thing together. So that should be great. I'm really hoping that'll be like Netflix or something. Yeah. I, I think it's perfect for it. Um, and I've been asked to be in a couple of other documentaries. So I feel like there'll be lots to chat about in the future if there's time to in or anything like that. And obviously it's this legal case to progress as there's um, probably going to be a bit of drama surrounding that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, yeah, we we'll have to definitely have you back on to update us on all this and we'll look out for the, um, the film. Nice. Thank you. Uh, thank you for everything that you do. I mean, this is activism as well. Well, if you were as moved as me by that interview, please do share this podcast with your friends and family and um, let's, you know, take action. We can, we, the power is in our hands. Next week, I'll be chatting to Despina Marcelou, who specialises in plant-based diet and immunity. In the meantime, head over to the Vegan Food and Living website where you can find all the latest news and loads of articles on the benefits of living a plant-based lifestyle.